Hello everyone and welcome to All Blaze No Glory, the podcast. Um, tonight's episode is me alone again. It's called Hills I'll Die On. And I know what you're thinking. Uh, you're a rather rotund individual. It's probably suffering from high blood pressure and stuff. Arthur's seat is probably a hill you would die on. Um, but that's not the type of hill I'm talking about. I'm talking about sporting takes. I'm talking about the type of takes that um, it'd be very difficult to change my mind in relation to. Um, different sports at different times some of them might be educated some of them might not be so educated um, when it comes to comes to this exercise but hey ho um, we'll have a chat about it anyway and um, we'll you know we'll see what we come up with so um, I am going to I have got rugby takes for people who normally tune in because think I just talk about rugby and I do talk about rugby more than any other sport um, it's probably the sport I follow the most um, in terms of uh, watching, um, although I coach um, the Caledonia Steel Queens. Now, before I go into the takes and all the rest of it, just a bit about the Caledonia Steel Queens. We are um, looking to go into the WNHL this year. Um, and here's actually a take that um, I'll die on. Uh, women's ice hockey is underserviced. Uh, there you go. Um, in the UK, it's probably underserviced the world over, um, but I can only comment on what I know in this one. Um Unfortunately, it's very difficult to get ice time. They're competing with the men's leagues um, and they are um, competing with the juniors. Now, juniors is very important, so I'm not suggesting that senior women's hockey should take the priority over the juniors, but there is, you know, argument about what should take priority when you've got, like, the third tier, fourth tier of men's league um, and the top tier of women's league, for example. Um, who is going to provide... GB players and I can tell you it's definitely the women's uh, top league um, and not the third or fourth tier of um, you know men's senior hockey but that's the way it works it's the way it works for ice rinks it's what people want to go and watch apparently um, even though actually women's hockey is probably as skillful as the men's in terms of tactics and everything you see some great cycle plays and stuff I don't know why people just prioritise that anyway um, that aside, um, as you can tell, I'm a big component of, um, a big fan of women's hockey and I coach the Caledonia Steel Queens. Um, just to keep you guys informed, we are applying to join the WNHL, which is a uh, league. Um, this year, I'm pleased to say that Scotland's currently only league team, the Solway Lady Sharks, uh, won their division and then went on to win the playoffs. So they got promoted to um, the first, sort of, so it's a second tier, but it's W. It's called WNHL One. Um, it's the first time uh, that they've been into that league. So good luck to them in that league. Um, and uh, it's great news for Scottish women's hockey because it means that they're on the up. Um, I think they've been around maybe ten years, maybe slightly more, slightly less. Um, but it's a great achievement um, for Scottish women's hockey. So well done to the Solway Women Sharks. We'll be joining the tier just below that, the tier that the Sharks just won, um, and we're really excited um, about it. Well, all, all things being equal, we're hoping to join it. Um, and I will be sharing some stuff as to how you can support the team. Um, and uh, there's already various items of like um, merch you can buy for the Steel Queens. Um, but if you're interested in helping in any way, um, if you are own a small company or anything, you want to do a match sponsorship or something like that with us, just please get in touch with us. Anyway, um, I've rabbited on about that. We're going to talk about hot takes in the world. I gave you the first one. Um, let's stick on the theme of ice hockey. Uh, and uh, this is a bit of a negative one, and I'm sure I'll get a lot of heat of this from, from certain factions of hockey fans. But I'm going to say this right out, that the elite league in the UK is rubbish. Um, that's the top league in the UK, and I actually think that, yes, okay, I'm sure there's very skilled hockey on display, but it's kind of like the whole Rangers and Celtic thing in football. Um, there's only a handful of teams that are going to win. Some teams will have fairy tale runs, but generally speaking, it's the same sort of teams that win. They've now got 15 imports in the league, um, so, you know, in terms of there's 10 teams in the league, you can ice up to 20 players in a game. Um, you know, well, you can roster up to 20 players in a game and two goalies. Um, essentially, um, if you're like 15 imports, as I think, as I understand it, it's 14 or 15, 
that leaves six or seven places for British players to develop for our national team. It's actually amazing that the British men's team have managed to get into the, um, you know, into the uh, top tier of ice hockey again, uh, of the World Championship ice hockey. Um, but it's just a bit naff for me. I don't know, it just seems to be full of, I don't know, like even the media on it is just rubbish. Like the commentary is the same all the time. And I know it's sitting here and you're like, ah, it's sour grapes because you commentate on the university hockey and you think you're great. Well, yeah, I enjoy what I do with university hockey. Could I do the Elite League? Oh, I don't know, maybe, but I'm, I'm not sitting here suggesting that I'm the alternative. I just think that it's not very well covered. Um, and uh, I think they had via play. I'm not sure if they still do. But it's just, for me, it's not great. And the, the reason it's not great is, one, I think that there's too much focus on how many imports you have. You hear fans talking about it like, oh, our team lost tonight because two of our imports were missing. What? Like... If you'd said that in any other sport, oh, two, uh, two of our imports were missing, so we lost the game, you'd be looked at like you had horns on your head. You know, the league, I have no difficulty with imports in any league, anything. That is a, we're a glo- the world's more open and travelling's become the norm and everybody gets on with each other, and I, I think that's great. But you have to think about it from the point of view of... Um, of anyone hearing that and if you've got a league where you just it's who can buy the best imports and not who's developed anyone then that's not a good league that's it's rubbish quite frankly and you know it's I had an interesting conversation with a I was at a 40th this past weekend with um with one of my one of our sort of friends well he is a friend I don't know why I said sort of I had a, a conversation with his grandfather who's a big Five Flyers fan and he was saying that the Flyers are in the wrong league and there needs to they should, they could go into one of the other leagues. The difficulty is to get into the National Ice Hockey League um, they need to be voted in by the other teams and um, I don't think they would want to travel to Fife um, because the National Ice Hockey League is obviously whilst it's well attended and actually I the games I've seen in the National Ice Hockey League are actually really entertaining. It's a great league. Um, and again, pleased to say the Solway Sharks men's team um, are entering that league and going to be in the National League, which I think is exactly where they belong because they get decent crowds. Dumfries is a real hockey town. Um, I'm not sure the Flyers would get into that league without the teams voting them in, and I'm not sure the teams would want to travel. Um, they could go into the SNL, but the Flyers with the funding they have, and they're the oldest team in Britain, um, likely hammer everyone in SNL. But I do agree that there's kind of some pathway missing um, in the uh, in British hockey, and it's it's there's some there needs to be somewhere in between. It used to be there was the British Premier League and the the Elite League, and they kind of mesh with each other and had a the Challenge Cup competition. Saw teams from the Elite League play teams from the British Premier League, and I think. They kind of need to bring back the Premier League, maybe promotion and relegation, um, maybe promotion and relegation through that and NIHL uh, one somehow, that kind of league where there can be a lot of to and fro um, would be the way to go. Um, maybe reduce the number of imports or have a cap that's better enforced um, so we don't get every team being, you know, the, the team with loads of money being the Saracens of... Uh, of of ice hockey in the UK and and just try and fix it because it's not great. Um, the other thing that's horrible about the elite league is that if recently there was a player, if he's not leaving the elite league, then he's a complete moron. Um, but he basically just said the elite league was awful and actually specifically called out the Scottish refs, which seemed a bit below the belt because having watched a few elite league games, um, they're all about equal. Uh, there's no, to me, there are top refs, yeah, but there's no, I'm not saying that you watch one of the, the sort of lesser known crews in Scotland and then one of the lesser known crews from England, you're like, oh wow, the English crew's a massive step up. They're about the same. Um, so, yeah, just not for me, the Elite League, I'm sorry. Um, I prefer watching the lower leagues, you know. I don't go and, again. I don't go and watch a lot of hockey because it kind of feels like work. Because I do a lot with the Steel Queens. I do a lot with the BIHA, um, doing fixtures and and commentary and all that sort of stuff. So 
I tend not to go mad following hockey because I'm already spending a lot of time and money on it. Um, so it doesn't feel like a rest necessarily. But yeah, the Elite League's not good. And that's that's my take. I, I think the Elite League should be scrapped and they should think us rethink everything. Um, anyway, um, that was that was the ice, I suppose, the ice hockey hot take. Well, you, you already heard my opinion how the women's game is, is slightly um, cast aside in the UK. Um, I don't think that's necessarily a hot take, though. I think that's quite common uh, the world over. Um, right, the next take, football. Um, I had this argument before, and we had a series of blog posts about it, and you can go back and look at that on the website if you've still got that. It's a Wix page. I think if you search all Blaze No you might find it. Uh, I can post you the link. It's, it's send me a message if you want to read it. Um, about ring fencing in football and how, you know, American sports tend to ring fence at the top leagues, which means, like, the, in the NHL, there's no promotion and relegation and have farm teams. Um, I know that a lot of Scottish football fans are against the sort of, I think the conference league's been suggested and there'll be a lot of B teams and stuff. And um, I get that. I get the way that football traditionally is, but I think one of the things that annoys me about football or why... In fact, here's the hot take. Here's the here's the hill I will down. The Scottish Premier League or Scottish Premiership pales in significance to the Scottish Championship in terms of excitement and um, competition. There you go. Um, there are two teams um, in the Scottish Premiership. In fact, currently, you could argue there's one team, but I know there'll be some Rangers fans listening to this um, that are going to win the league or have a high chance of winning the league. Um, even the English Premier League has more, how can I put it, changeover in champions. I mean, we saw Leicester win a championship, Liverpool recently, Man City. I know Man City have won it a few times, but you see other teams having a go. Whereas this year, this the Scottish Premiership has been, what, Celtic won it so many times in a row, Rangers won it so many times in a row. Celtic won so many times in a row. Rangers got stopped them winning it. Celtic have now won it so many times. Won treble after treble after treble after treble. It's you know it's boring. Um, <laughs> maybe not boring for Rangers and Celtic fans, but as an outsider looking in, if you're looking at that league and you're just like, well, it's just two teams that have bought the league. Um, and it's not Rangers and Celtic's fault. They're very popular clubs. Um, and they're successful because they're popular clubs and they have the money to spend on quality players. Um, they have the money to get good coaches, good managers. Um, they have, unfortunately have the money to steal away players that have been coached up really well by other clubs, um, which again is not their fault. It's just the structure. So, yeah, whereas the championship, there's been multiple different winners. Um, it seems to go down to the wire a lot more. Um, Dundee won the league this year. I think it was the last day of the season that they actually won the league. Um, or second to last day of the season, something like that. So, you know, it's much more exciting and goes down to the wire. And um, it's, you know, it's not got the name players, you know, the big name players that um, they have in, in maybe in the Scottish leagues, um, but in the Scottish Premiership, sorry. But for me, the Scottish Premiership is rubbish because we pretty much know... Um, who the winners are going to come from every year and to me that's not exciting it's not great competition and I don't know what they can do to resolve it like how they call the other teams back into it and give them a chance without being unfair to Rangers and Celtic I think it's just that over time this has built up and I don't think the Scottish Premiership will ever be as exciting as the Scottish Championship unless for example some crazy mad millionaire decides to buy hearts um, you know, or Hibs or Motherwell or whoever, um, the Scottish Premiership's going to continue to be rubbish until that's, that's sorted out. Um, again, maybe not a hot take for many people. Maybe Many people would agree with that. But for me, it's not worth watching the Scottish Premiership necessarily unless you are get excited by your team just finishing third. Um, and to me, again, you know, you want to see a, a situation where maybe your team can win you. You maybe go in every season, like I do as an Edinburgh rugby fan, saying mid-table would be pretty good. But um, you, you don't um, 
necessarily going into the season thinking, oh, my team's got a chance to win, which, you know, as an Edinburgh rugby fan, I do think that there have are occasions where if Edinburgh are going to run, they have a chance to win the league. If you look at the league in the URC this year, Munster surprisingly won the league. So it's not impossible um, for dark horses to win in some of these leagues. Yeah, um, we could all argue that Leinster are just a powerhouse, but Leinster it might be bad management. <laughs> it might be bad luck. Leinster decided to rest players in the semi-final, lost, made a fool of themselves, didn't win. So that's up to that was their decision to do that, and um, but they didn't win the league after all that. So um, yeah, Scottish Premiership not as good as Scottish Championship. So that is a hill I will die on, um, and it's going to have to go a long way to persuade me otherwise. Um, looking out of the, let's look at sports across the pond now. NFL. Um, we talk about the goat. I'm not sure that this is maybe that hot a take, but it is definitely a hell of a time. Aaron Rodgers has more talent than Tom Brady. Tom Brady has a better mental game than Aaron Rodgers. Um, that is a hell of a time. Uh, Aaron Rodgers, I think, undeniably has, over the sample size I've seen, I've been watching American football for now quite commonly for about 12 years I used to watch bits and pieces of it but you know 12, 12 years or so I've been watching the NFL I've been going to London games keeping an eye on everything and I definitely think that Aaron Rodgers is a more talented quarterback but I think the reason that Tom Brady is actually the, the GOAT and I've described Tom Brady on uh, podcasts before as the uh, Johnny Sexton of the NFL because you have to admire how good he is but you don't really like him um, so um, yeah I think that if you look at Aaron Rodgers his ability to run um, and move and sling it is better than Tom Brady's probably in terms of the actual physical abilities of football I th- of American football that is um, Whereas I think Tom Brady um, has the the brain and the intelligence and the patience and mental fortitude to be the greatest of all time. And I think that's why he does actually um, come before Aaron Rodgers. So I don't know what you think of that. Again, this is a podcast about me rambling about what you think about. So if you think that's rubbish, then you tell me that's rubbish. Um, the other thing I'll say about the NFL is the underrate running backs, in my opinion, um, especially nowadays where running back, um, running backs are trained to be receivers as well in the NFL. So if you don't know, running backs are they are what they say on the tin. They kind of like workhorses, a little bit like ball carriers, so like a back row or something that like trucks the ball up. Um, in terms of back row, like a rugby player. Um, however. Um, as you know, in America, in in NFL, if you're aware that you can throw the ball forward, um, now these running backs are also trained to come out of the run, like to fake running and catch the ball and stuff. And I think that's underrated because they're actually doing two things in the offense that the wide receivers aren't necessarily doing. But because of the mileage they put into their body in terms of the hits they take and things like that, because they're having to come to contact quicker normally. Um, they get banged up and I think they don't get paid early enough in their career and then by the time they've had a lot of mileage on them they then are underrated and they don't get paid enough either so yeah I think um, running backs are criminally underrated in the NFL Um, you might not care about that but I I think it's a real shame uh, that like for example um, this week a running back called Dalvin Cook who played for the Minnesota Vikings or did play for the Minnesota Vikings is going to, it was announced he's going to be released He's only 28 years old and he's been viewed as past it, which with the work he's done is a lot of work over his years, you know, like 300 touches of the ball. And that may seem like not very much, but the um, the way the NFL has played, it's all about explosion, 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 and, and people get obliterated in tackles because of all the, the pads are on. There's no need to be, you know, technically sound at tackling. Well, they are, but, you know, a lot of them... <laughs> aren't so technically sound as tackling as perhaps 
we've seen some rugby players, and I say some rugby players because we've seen some horror shows this year um, in rugby, let alone years past. Um, so they get smashed a lot. So I understand, but he he's been cut from his contract, and and isn't <laughs> isn't due to due to. Uh, stay with the team he's with who are willing to just let him go for nothing whereas they could have traded him um, to save money because again running backs are undervalued so that's that's another hot hot take hill I'll die on um, next up basketball um, I've not got a lot to say about basketball other than um, anyone who thinks that um, LeBron James Steph Curry or anyone else is um, in their prime, a better basketball player than Michael Jordan ever was, is bonkers. Um, Michael Jordan is, you can say what you like about his personality, but he is the greatest basketball player of all time. Um, I know that you could argue on the Bulls teams when he they done their you know uh, th- two three peats um, that he had such a great cast around him, Dennis Rodman, Scott Pippen, etc. etc. However, um, Michael Jordan, uh, once he retired from basketball, went back after buying the uh, Washington Wizards and was still putting up really great numbers on a pretty bang average, if not worse, team. So is Michael Jordan um, the greatest of all time? Yes. he was. I mean, the Bills weren't good in these early days either. Um, and, you know, he was shown out and people were amazed by what he could do. So... Michael Jordan is is the greatest of all time, and people who think LeBron James or Steph Curry are better are bonkers. I'm sorry, uh, it's just one of these things. Um, now here's a, here's a, a more wide take. Um, baseball is underrated. Uh, I think in outside of the USA, um, you have to go some to find proper baseball fans in the UK. I mean, I play a bit of softball. I haven't played for a few months um, since we got the puppy, um, just because of how busy I've been and busy with work and stuff. But even the, a lot of softball players, if you talk to them about baseball, um, <laughs> and, you know, Scottish softball players, they don't know much of what's going on with baseball. And that's fine. Like, I'm not saying everybody needs to follow the American League, but... It's just an underrated sport for watching. Um, it's very, very skilled. Um, it's like it's like a bit of a, like a drama series in sport because you know, like you get like the really <laughs> maybe you're just maybe I'm just a geek, but like even like batter versus pitcher battles where you know the pitcher's trying to like fool the batter into swinging at things they shouldn't be, and the the batter's maybe fouling things off, and you get these eight nine pitch at bats. That's exciting to me. It's like it's you know, it's a proper battle of wits as well as as um, you know pace and power and um, you know teamwork because you have to be able to get in the right place to catch a ball and all this stuff. And it's a lot like if you've not been, it, it looks on TV a lot easier to chase down some of these fly balls than it does actually when you're in the stadium. Um, equally, the balls look like they travel faster on the TV than they do in the stadium. So I suppose it's a it's a um, a little bit of a catch to it too in that sense. But yeah, baseball for me is is one of the most underrated sports out with the US, I think, in in the world. Um, and it's it's terrific. I, I love I love baseball. Um, and on a slightly different note, um, uh, racquetball. I don't know if you. Oh, sorry, paddleball. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of this, but paddleball is like played by a tennis ball, kind of a tennis court, but you can out off the back. It's kind of like a cross between tennis and squash. Um, it may be for me um, a sport that should be way more popular than it is because uh, it's quite exciting. The rallies are quite interesting because obviously you can twat, twat off the back of the court and all sorts of stuff. The serving's underhanded, so I recommend checking out paddleball if you haven't already done so. Um, and that is a hill I will die on. I will die on the fact that paddle ball should be a much more prime time sport. Um, because I recently started watching a bit of it in Euro Eurosport. I have no idea the names of any of the players or anything, but yeah, I got super into it one day to the point where, you know, um, I surprised myself how long I'd watched it because I had never seen it before. Um, lastly, I said I'm getting to sort of retakes, so um, I've kept you holding on long enough. So. Um, I asked people online, 
Um, and generally, most people come to me. Most people that follow me are rugby fans. Um, I do have other sports fans follow me, but most of the people that follow me are rugby fans. Um, so I asked if anyone had any hills to be die on. Um, and the basic response was not amazing, but then I'm not, not that many people follow me. I'm not the Scottish Rugby World or whatever. So um, I had um, Happy as Girl D, she said it sounds good that I'm doing this. I hope it sounds good to you, actually, uh, that you've been listening to it. Um, and then I had two actual sort of takes. So the first one was from Andy Niven, who said, for professional sports, 3G pitches have no place in football or rugby. Now, before I give any view on this, um, I can't remember if the 3D ones or the like, if 3G or the rubber crumb ones, or if that's 4G, um, or if he, if Andy is, and uh, I make this mistake too, um, just meaning that artificial pitches in general should have no place in professional sports like rugby or football. Um, I think there's certain sports where I would say they definitely do have a place. Um, like baseball, uh, hockey, um, and a probably um, like NFL and stuff, it doesn't make much of a difference because of all the padding and stuff. Although my understanding is that one of the big problems with it is the movement is not the same and players are getting caught and stuff. Now, I have played on, I think, 4G twice, maybe three times at Murrayfield. Well, if you include the sort of open rugby days they did at Murrayfield, which they've never done since, presumably too many people got injured, but um, I've played on it maybe, maybe five or six times. I would say that I found that running on them, certainly in a straight line, was more comfortable than running on grass, um, particularly in the summer. I think in the summer these pitches certainly have their place when the ground is absolutely rock solid for rugby. For football, I think you can play football more rock solid ground because you don't have to leave your foot in football for tackles. Um, I suppose when you if somebody tackles you, gets the ball and you fall over the ball, then you do fall on the ground. But I, I, I'm not sure that there are, that it's as important um, to have a slightly softer pitch if you're doing the full Buna sport in football as it is in rugby. Um, so from that sense of the thing, running on it felt more comfortable to me, certainly in a straight line. I'm not much of a sidestepper. Um, I do like to try, I'd probably make a fool of myself more than anything when I played rugby. Um, I didn't really notice much of a difference from any form of running. I found that the good thing for me about the 4G pitch, and this is the old 4G pitch at Moneyfield or 3G pitch at Moneyfield, whatever it was, I found the good thing about it was that you didn't have to worry about what studs you needed. You could have full studs or you could have mouldies. They, either way, they would the pitch would take it. Unlike, again, the full pitch um, that you that you you know you play on normally like a full grass pitch because you're not sure like it, even if it's been wet it might have been dry all week so you, you it might not take your full studs so you need to have your moldies with you or you need to have a smaller studs with you if you're Sean Finlay who used to play for Foresters you have about eight pairs of boots with you some spares for the lads in case they forget them but not everyone has that <laughs> that opportunity so if you turned up with your full um, studs on and then it didn't work then you had no choice. So um, I would say for amateur, it probably much of a muchness. Um, however, the risk of injury, I suppose, is the question. Personally, I I understand that the rubber crumb pitches, particularly, um, falling on them is sore. Um, I went down on a ball, a loose ball. We um, Foresters were playing. I think it was Murrayfield. In a, like a pre-season friendly on a Tuesday night or it was maybe during the season but whatever it was, it was a friendly and um, we lost the ball and I jumped on top of it going backwards and I was picking rubber crumb out of my leg for about a week um, and my leg was completely like done in it was minging um, so yes, I think the risk of injury in, in terms of like falling on it and stuff like that does come across as high although I'm not sure, you know, again, with the difference in 
grass types and stuff like that. Um, whether you know you can you could still get similar injuries playing on on grass in the summer or whatever. Um, however, yeah, for professional sports, if it's risky injury, I think I can understand the argument against it. At the end of the day, players are commodities in a sense. Um, they are assets to a team, and you've got to protect those assets. So having a pitch that you can potentially lose a player on because they've twisted their ankle. If that's more likely to happen, and again, statistically, I don't know if it is because I'm not, I've not done the research on it. Then I do think that they should, we have to reconsider it at the top end of sport. I think we have to be realistic. Um, in the URC, for example, are the clubs rich enough to maintain pitches all year? I mean, if you're being honest with it, a lot of players might have preferred to play on artificial pitches in South Africa to what they did play on. I mean, that Stormers pitch looked horrid um you know the storm is put in in the semi-final uh, and all the rest of it. it was all cutting up and churned up pretty quickly um to the point that um even ap on twitter who's a, a south african fan mentioned it regularly um so i think you have to look at what the clubs can afford to do and if they've not got the ground staff or the infrastructure to have a good pitch like Murrayfield, the main Murrayfield pitch is that hybrid pitch and I think that's the way to go um, but I would say that potentially when you're looking at the the sort of rubber crumb pitches at the lower sort of leagues, if they can't afford to implement a hybrid pitch then I think it's probably an, a necessary evil to make sure that the clubs have a pitch that's constantly playable Um so yeah, that's that's one thing. I think in football it's a bit different because there's more money in football. So yeah, I can see why the argument there needs to be grass. Um, but I think it's maybe a bit late now. If clubs have already put it in, they're not going to change that. Um, but I I agree to I agree to an extent. I think the the thing is it is it's whether it's a necessary evil or not. If clubs are going to have pitches that are all holy and churned up, and that can be just as dangerous as is the rubber crumb pitch and. and what I you know from the eye test um but equally you know if if the, these pitches are avoidable and you can get hybrid pitch and stuff like that I think yeah that should be the way it go if you can if your club can afford it because it's definitely safer um it's definitely the I mean since Murrayfield's been done I don't think as many players I, I don't think as many if any players that have been injured because they played on on Murrayfield's hybrid pitch um so I hope that kind of answers that question um, or uh, gives you gives you my take on it, but I certainly uh, I can understand that's why I, that's a very reasonable hill to want to die on, Andy. Um, so the next one is a uh, worried McWorried face, and they've just put um, for their sort of hill they'll die on Roman Platt question mark. So I'm not entirely sure what the take is, whether it's Roman Platt's amazing or Roman Pratt's Roman Pratt. That might be a Freudian slip. Um, is terrible. Um. I think in a way I find Roman Platt kind of interesting. <laughs> I don't think he's a ter like he's the worst like a ref that I've sat there and went consistently he is the worst ref in the world. But there is a he's definitely a ref that I have had a lot of sort of grimaces in his some of his decision making about. And um, that might be because I'm Scottish and I'm tired of getting beat by Ireland. Um but equally, I mean the funniest one for me was when he put his head like into the bottom of that like rock slash mall thing when Scotland were playing Ireland and was there for a good 10 seconds before he gave the try. <sighs> I'm not sure for me, um, you know, I'm not sure that this is, a, I'm not sure what the hell to die on is on this one, but if it's Roman Platt is the worst ref ever, he is certainly not to me. If um, it's that Roman Poit is the last of the character refs, well, I suppose he's retired now, so he's not there anymore, then he was a character. I loved him as a... He was a character. <laughs> he was a ref in our team. Um, I was quite happy with that. Uh, I do think I shuddered when he ref Scotland. Um, however, more so, I felt... I feel that the ref for me that... Probably gives me the most that gives me the most upset is is uh, Carl Dixon, um. So 
I can't say that Roman Platt is terrible uh, or was the worst ref ever. And obviously in Scotland, we've, we've still got to be in our bonnet about a certain event in 2015, which we don't mention anymore, um, and and what happened there. But, um, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm not entirely sure what the point was, but, um, yeah, Roman Platt for me, uh, I would give him a, a C grade um, as a ref. Um, anyway, um, takes the one that I said would scare Glasgow Warrior fans away from me. And this is a hill that I'll die on and no one can ever prove it or disprove it. Sam Hidalgo Klein was the most mishandled talent that SRU ever had at their disposal in the professional era. And if he had been handled right, he would have been going on the Lions tour. He would have played as many games, if not more, than Ali Price. Um, and he would have been a Scotland's rugby legend. Um, and I mean this, having watched him when I was a season ticket holder that never really missed a game for Edinburgh. Um, his ability, he could kick uh, for goal. And he was very accurate. Um, a lot of people actually commented, particularly Forrester, fan, uh, Forrester players, because um, he did play there for a spell. A lot of people commented on when Scotland lost to USA, why was Kinghorn taking a kick and not um, Sam Hidalgo Klein, who had come on the park? I have to, I tend to agree with that. He's so accurate. Um, I suppose he was maybe a bit cold. Um, he. People slagged him off saying he didn't have a pass and stuff, but I mean, that time in Cardiff where they dropped the pass, for me, he was on the park f way too late after. Ali Price had had a shocker um, and then made a pass that somebody dropped. Who's, I mean, before that, people seem to forget, before that, when he came on, the team started moving better and Duncan Taylor scored a try that got us close enough to get back into that game um, in Wales. I can't remember what year it was. Um, so, uh, Hidalgo Klein, yeah, for me, I, I honestly think if he was... if. I don't understand why... There's a lot of things I don't understand about it. One, I don't understand why Vern Cotter um, picked him for the Rugby World Cup squad in 2015 and then didn't play him in any game apart from a small portion of the South Africa game. And I didn't understand that when we were at... You know, when, when we had the Australian quarter final, you had Laidlaw. And at the time, Laidlaw was thought of as quite slow. And then he picked Purgos, who at the time, for me, his delivery's always been around the sort of laid law, considered slow rate, if not slower. So why did you not have the change of pace, man, in Hidalgo Klein? It's a bit like, you know, now they've got Ben White. Who's the change of pace, man? Now, Ali Price argues, play now can come in and calm the game down. Um, and you've got, you've got Horn, who's the change of pace guy, because Horn's rapid, he likes to snipe and, and all that sort of stuff. Ben White's kind of that hybrid between Ali Price and, and George Horn uh, now. Um, is that a thing that Scotland try and coach that creativity out of their scrum halves? I, I, I don't know. But yeah, Sam Adalwell Klein for me is the biggest waste of talent that the SRU have had. Um, and I think that if they had have managed him better, um, when he was with Vern Cotter, Maybe got him back into the Six Nations squad quite quickly. I think he maybe was injured, so that's maybe not fair. But, you know, I think he he then got kind of swept away to the side um, when Townsend came in. Um, and I don't think it was fair on him. I think Hidalgo Klein then lost his way a bit and he's bounced around from club to club. I can't even tell you what club he's at now. Um, but he was, to me, um, wasn't the messiah maybe, but I think he was the type of player that if he had been looked after and and played and developed properly, um, he could have been um, the best, one of the best Scottish nines of the professional era, if not the best. And certainly I think he would have been, you know, with the amount of caps that Ali Price has had, I think he'd had more than Ali Price right now. I think he would have went on the Lions tour in 2019. I think he would have, eh, sorry, in 2017. 2021 even <laughs> uh, I think he would have went on the Lions tour um, as as well so 
Yeah, that that's that's the first one, and I'm sorry, Glasgow Warriors fans, because I know that you guys love Ali Price, and whenever I say anything about Ali Price, everyone kicks off and says, "Oh, he's a British Lion and all the rest of it." I know he is, um, but then Ben White wasn't in anyone's radar when the British Lions were a thing, and now Ben White is is should be the shoe in to be Scotland's star now. Um, so that that was that was one hot take, and more away from that hot take is that. That Mapimpe is a better a better um, winger than Dranzi and um, Mapimpe. Eh, then he, he is Mapimpe. Then Colby. Um, I think that Colby gets a lot of, a lot of uh, high praise because he's so small and he can jump high uh, and he can kick, but he's not he's not Mapimpe levels of strong. He's um, not as he is a good player. I'm not going to sit here and say Kobe's not a good player. I just think that Mapimpe, if you look at them, they both had around the same amount of caps. Pimpy had way more tries than him. Um, <laughs> at one point, and it's like there's nobody noticed that because everyone keeps talking about how great Cheslin Kobe is. Um, Mapimpe has had about the same amount of caps and has more tries. So that's another another take, and that's something we'll discuss on the next rugby podcast we have. Uh, which is fraternising with the enemy, um, and that's me talking to J um, and AP, um, an Irish and uh, South African rugby uh, rugby fans, and talking to them about um, the Rugby World Cup, how they view their chances, and what they fear most about Scotland, which might be absolutely nothing, but we'll find out. Um, anyway, I've talked enough. Um, this is the longest solo podcast I've ever done. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, leave me a leave me a review or send me a tweet and say shut up and don't make so many solo podcasts again. Um, let me know what you think and thank you so much for tuning in. Um, I hope you've had a nice time listening. Um, if you have any views or if you're affected by any of the material in this podcast, then please let us know. Um, okay, cheers. Thanks.